Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Chong Jian Khan, and uh, good day, everybody. It's my great pleasure to spend a few minutes with you today talking about uh, power system stability in systems which are dominated by inverter based resources. <clears throat> the first thing I want to say is a little bit about the difference between inverter based resources in systems than conventional generators. In the conventional system, it's very well defined by its physics. We know the equations of motion of the rotor, we know the electrical equations, we know how they couple. We can build bottom up physics based models. They might be very large, they will have nonlinearities and all sorts of complications. I'm not saying it's trivial, but it's physics based at least. And if we change and look instead at an inverter based resource, it has some physical characteristics, but the way it presents itself to the grid is entirely based on its control system, or if you like, its control software. So we describe these as software defined behaviors. Why is that a problem? It's a problem in the sense that each manufacturer approaches this slightly differently. They have their own favored ways of configuring control loops. They treat that as a commercial secret. And so it's very difficult for system operators and other analysts to build a bottom up model of the system that really truly represents the behavior across all the operating points. We might get simulation models as a black box, but there are limitations to what you can do with simulation models compared with analytical models. <clears throat> and we know this is a problem because we see around the world in various places oscillations develop that weren't anticipated from the connection studies. And worse than that, when a diagnostic um, investigation is run after the event, sometimes they don't even show up in those models. So how do we prepare ourselves for assuring ourselves of stability of systems when faced with these problems? We're going to spend a moment just reflecting on how stability is defined in the classical sense. This is the work of Kunda and many others over many years, dividing up the stability space in a number of ways. And one of the ways is to think about the variables involved, frequency, angle, voltage, and also the time scales over which the effects evolve. So if we think about frequency, it's relatively slow. It's typically over tens of seconds and minutes. And if the angle dynamics are well controlled, then they don't couple into the frequency dynamics. We can treat these as two separate issues. And that's a great benefit in simplifying the system model to get analytical insight into how it operates. When we turn instead to inverter-based um, resources within a system, we see a couple of things change. First, we see so much faster effects, electromagnetic modes developing, which are um, in the millisecond region and won't get picked up in phaser models. We also see the frequency dynamics becoming um, elongated. It some of the effects are in very short timescales, seconds or subsecond even. And that means they start to overlap with the angle dynamics and we get coupling between those. And the angle dynamics become faster as well and start to couple into the voltage dynamics. So these complicate the picture, means the, the traditional separation that enables us to get to analytical insights has become substantially more difficult. I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time looking at some of those forms of stability. And let me start with frequency um, and think about the grid forming inverter. So this is an inverter that presents as a voltage source where the frequency and amplitude depend on the real and reactive power flows from, from that resource. And, and we've known for some time how to represent this in terms of frequency uh, dynamics. We can remind ourselves that the measured power influences the frequency or the frequency depends on the power. And it does so when we measure the power normally through low pass filter. So that's where we've introduced some dynamics. And then the difference between the power and its reference value is used to droop or, or, or reduce the frequency. And that gives us a coupling frequency depending on power that gives us something that looks just like a swing equation for a synchronous machine. We can identify terms that look like inertia and look like damping and depend on the characteristics of that droop. A grid following inverter presents as a current source in the standard format. Those current references are pretty much constant because they come from real and reactive power references, which are constant. In other words, this device doesn't respond to changes in the grid. 
We can add further control loops on top to make it grid supporting. And we can choose to um, look at the phase lock loop, which will indicate the frequency and use that frequency to cause the power to change. So we're observing frequency through a phase lock loop. So there's dynamics. And then as the frequency moves away from the normal value, we reduce the, the power reference. So again, we get something that looks a bit like a swing equation with things that look like inertia and with damping. But on the right hand side, there's some additional dynamics that the PLL appears in more than one place. Nevertheless, we can combine these two sets of resources and indeed synchronous machines into overall swing equations. Let's see how well that works. We took an example and tested it in the IEEE 14 bus system where synchronous machines have been replaced by grid following and grid forming inverters. What you see here on the left hand side is a comparison of the swing equations that I've just talked about and an EMT simulation. If we, we looked at two um, loss of infeeds and one load rejection, that's case three. So let's concentrate on case three. The center of inertia or the weighted average of the frequencies is the black line, the solid line is the simulation, the dashed line, the swing equation, and you see they correspond quite well. And then in orange, we've got the frequency at bus 11. So the first thing you notice is that that's oscillating with respect to the center of inertia and quite fast. So there's quite a high rate of change of frequency immediately after the load rejection. Um, slight dis difference between the simulation and the swing equations, and that's because in the swing equations, we treated devices as current sources and voltage sources, as assuming the current and voltage controllers were perfect. Nevertheless, the swing equations capture this quite well and give us certain insights. So first of all, we see that the dynamics are very fast. Here it's in uh, approximately half a second. And that individual buses swing more because of the coupling of angle dynamics and frequency dynamics. And if you look on the right hand side at the rate of change of frequency, the grayed out results are from the initial case where the rates of change of frequency in all the buses are quite high. But we can change the inertia at various buses by changing droop settings and bring rates of change of frequency at all the individual buses beneath whatever target we set. And that works quite well. But one of the things we observe in doing that is that grid forming and grid following contribute their inertias quite differently. Grid forming inertia appears pretty much straight away. Grid following inertia, because it has to observe frequency through a phase lock loop, comes in that bit later. So it's not in helping us very much with the initial rate of change of frequency. Let me move on and say a bit about angle. Um, we just I've just talked about the droop of power against frequency, which is the top left hand side for grid forming. We're measuring power by measuring voltage times current or D axis voltage and D axis current normally. But for a voltage source, which is well regulated, so the voltage we can almost treat as constant, in which case what we're really doing is we're comparing D axis current with the reference value and then adjusting the frequency and phase. It's almost like a phase lock loop working on the current flow. The grid following is explicitly a phase lock loop. So it's the bottom right diagram. We, we try to null out the Q axis um, voltage for a current source, so the current's well-defined. So the Q-axis voltage times the D-axis current is given us reactive power. This is pretty much like a droop for reactive power. And this leads us into looking at these two devices as duals of each other. Grid forming forms a grid voltage. It follows or synchronizes with the current and power swings against angle. And for the grid following, it forms a current because it's a current source. It follows or synchronizes to the grid voltage and voltage swings against angle. That duality carries forward into looking at st angle stability. So on the left-hand side for small signal effects, it's often said that a grid following inverter becomes unstable in a weak grid or high impedance situation. Yes, but it's slightly more complicated. It's really about voltage drops across impedances interacting with both the phase lock loop and the current controllers. And it's a combination of poor tuning or component choices of the three of them that's most likely to get you into instability. In fact, for a weak grid with well-chosen current controllers and PLLs, you can remain stable down to very low values. The main point, however, is really the, the duality. If you look at the grid forming inverter, it's more likely to be unstable in a strong grid or with a low voltage control bandwidth or a high 
droop bandwidth. And those combinations are in some way the dual of the grid following. And it carries forward again into um, large signal transients. But I'm going to move on because I'm a bit short of time. I want to say a bit about how we deal with the fact that the controllers are opaque to the system operator. Something a system operator could do, either by direct measurement or by measurements off a time domain simulation, is scan impedances at various nodes of the system. And wherever they see a high peak, that's indicating a mode. And what we want to know is how can you deal with that mode? What might you change to damp it better? And the approach we talk about is to factorize those equations into residue and pole format. And the residues tell you how impedances affect mode place placement. So the system operator knows that bit of the puzzle. The equipment vendor knows the bit of the puzzle that how phase lock loop bandwidths or other parameters affect impedance. And those two groups, the system operator and the vendors, each hold half of the chain of how you restabilize the system. Quick comment about um, grid strength. It's often taken to be a discussion of short circuit ratio or short circuit current. We argue that actually you have lots of different reasons to think about grid strength, to look at voltage regulation, small signal stability, protection operation. Some of these are large signal effects, some are small, some are single or fundamental frequency, some are wideband. And we argue that you need to develop different indicators of grid strength for all of those. Let me quickly summarize. IBR are causing the dynamics of systems to couple more than they ever did, and that complicates things. We argue that duality helps you understand that world better and deal with mixed combinations of grid forming and grid following, and that there are ways of turning black box or encrypted simulation models into useful analytical tools or a gray box format. There's lots of stuff still to do in this area, particularly dealing with nonlinearities, of which there are many in inverters, and finding the right balance between exploiting the flexibility of an inverter versus giving it some standard characteristics that help us ensure system stability. Thank you very much.